Hey guys, here we are again, reading A Pinch of Magic by Michelle Harrison, and excited to get into it. Hopefully you got to hang out at the library, or visit your local bookstore, check out some new books, or some stories that interest you. Um, I'm not a professional reader or voiceover person. I'm just a mama with three kids of my own, and I'm grateful to be reading to you guys today and to them. All right, here we go. A Pinch of Magic by Michelle Harrison. All right, the morning dawned to a thick fog sweeping in off the marshes. It sprawled over the streets and seeped into the poacher's pocket in damp, salty drafts. Betty woke with even frizzier hair than usual. She shivered into freezing clothes and wriggled into a pair of Fliss's hand-me-down boots, which were a smidge too big. Stamping into the kitchen to try to warm herself, she found Fliss at the stove. Morning, Fliss said. Morning, Betty suppressed the yawn gritty-eyed. She watched as her older sister ladled porridge into a chipped bowl for Charlie, who was waiting impatiently. The scene was so reassuringly familiar that Betty fleetingly wondered if she had dreamed of the events the previous evening, and there was no curse or magical family heirlooms. But then she saw that Fliss's smile was tight and heard the tapping of Charlie's spoon on her dish, which was more of a nervous tremble than a merry jingle. Betty's stomach lurched. Nope, everything that had happened last night was real, all right. A curse and three magical objects. Stones dropping out of the tower walls. She replayed the powers of each item in her head. Then thought about the curse again. Though Granny hadn't said as much, Betty couldn't help wondering if the magical objects and the curse were connected. Granny's still in bed, Fliss said distractedly. She said she's got a stinker of a headache. I'm not surprised, Betty muttered, when she had crept back to replace the tin last night her grandmother had been frowning even in her sleep betty's eyes watered a little to think of how hard it must have been for poor granny to be responsible for them all while keeping such a terrible secret bliss gave the pot another stir the smell of singed porridge floated past betty's nose want some betty's eye the gray gloop i'll have it if betty don't want it, Charlie interrupted, scraping out her bowl. Charlie was always hungry and would eat practically anything. She had been the same ever since she was a baby, so much so that Granny always said she must have worms. Father, who always had to exaggerate, said they were eels, not worms. You have it, Betty ignored the rumbling in her tummy. This was easier than usual now that her thoughts were occupied by the curse, especially since she made it up her mind to break it. Fliss gave Betty a meaningful glance. Gra- Granny said she's not visiting father today. Betty's ears pricked up at once. Oh, isn't she? Granny had missed a couple of visits recently with flimsy excuses. However, last night's discovery made this all the less surprising, seeing as her father hadn't been there for months. The only other thing connecting the Wildershins to the prison was the stones falling from Crowstone Tower. Could Granny's recent busy be linked to the curse and not to their father, perhaps they could find out if they dared. Fliss glanced at Charlie, who was still shoveling down her lumpy breakfast. What about church? Betty asked. Fliss made a face. About it. Granny only went to church to stay on the right side of the customers. Given what a sinful place Crowstone was, everyone on the outside of the prison was eager to prove how law-abiding and repenting they were. Betty didn't enjoy going either. It was bottom-numbingly cold, and Granny often dozed off and embarrassed them by snoring. Fliss, on the other hand, was always looking for ways to be a nicer person. At times her attention wandered, however, only to be caught by whichever lad was the laziest to take her fancy. Charlie was simply there for the warm bread rolls handed out to the poor folk at the end, and would loiter around looking for looking mournful until she was taken pity on. I wonder if that means we don't have to go to Sunday school, then Fliss mused, seeing as Granny's not going to the prison today. She scraped some porridge into a bowl for herself, grimacing as she forced a mouthful down. But I want to go, Charlie piped up, licking her bowl. 
We're finishing the blankets for the orphans this week. You can still go, Charlie dear, Flissus soothed her. We know you enjoy it. You know, Betty said with a sidelong glance at Fliss. Now that you're 16, we wouldn't need Granny to come to the prison with us to see Father, if he still wanted to see us. I mean, you're right, Fliss replied. She lowered her voice and looked thoughtful. But surely being alone is only making her, him gloomier. Perhaps what he needs is a nice surprise. She caught Betty's eye, and the two sisters shared a look, the kind of look that used to pass between them often but hadn't in a long time. It was a secret look, and it was one Betty had missed. They both knew, without any words, exactly what they were going to do. They left after church a couple hours later, moving briskly through the cobbled streets, ducking their faces from view whenever someone came the opposite way. Delicious smells of roasting meat wafted through the cracked windows. Betty's stomach rumbled, but as they neared the marshes, briny air dampened her hunger. I'm not sure about this, Betty. What if Charlie lets us slip to Granny? Fliss's voice was low and nervous. Damp air blew their hair around their faces. Fliss is like a long silk scarf, and Betty's like a mass of dry wool. <laughs> they drew their shawls more tightly around their shoulders, shivering. Charlie will be too busy yapping about what she did at Sunday school to care about us, said Betty. Anyway, it won't matter if she does. She thought of her father's hidden letters. By the time Granny hears about it, we'll have found out who she was visiting and why. We can play dumb and say we wanted to surprise Father. We're not doing anything wrong, exactly. The prison came into view in the distance, farther away to the left, where the other sorrow islands and beyond, a smear of gray on the horizon. The next town along from Marshfoot is Mary on the Marsh, Pliss said softly. Do you suppose we'll ever see what they've got to be merry about? We will if I have anything to say about it, Betty answered more bravely than she felt. Yesterday, crossing Crowstone's boundaries had simply been an adventure. Today she knew it. She knew that something that would kill them. Yet Betty couldn't deny... Let me start that one again. Today she knew it was something that would kill them. Yet Betty couldn't deny an undercurrent of excitement. For so long as she had wished for something to happen, and now it was happening. Or at least... It could happen. Whatever Granny said, there had to be a way to change things. They arrived at Ferry Point shortly before the boat docked at the platform. The only passengers aside from a wizened old woman. They paid their fares and clambered on. The early morning mists had cleared, and patches of blue sky were peeking through the thick cloud. In the distance, a tiny ship bobbed on glittering water, reminding Betty of the day she had spent with the map maker's daughter. Where was Roma now? How much more of the world had she seen while Betty had been stagnating here? Do you remember those stories father used to tell? Betty asked. The only ones he had heard from the merchants and sailors about beaches with golden sand as fine as sugar and water so clear that you could see the bottom. Fliss, can you hear that guy? That's a little dog next to me snoring. <laughs> Fliss nodded, her mouth twisting as she looked over the soupy water stretching away from them. I used to love those stories, but they just became harder and harder to imagine. Betty gazed toward repent as a troubling thought occurred to her. What if Granny just been coming here to appeal, to get Father moved back? Suddenly doubts were pressing in on her. Already she had known the chances of a link to the curse were slim. But they had no other leads. Fliss frowned. I don't think so. The visiting slips have a prisoner's number on them. A prisoner's number? But we'll need that. Fliss grinned, patting her bag. Good thing I brought it then. Betty sagged against the side of the boat with relief. Whew, I'm surprised Charlie didn't insist on them coming with us, she murmured, once they'd pushed off from land. Her warm breath midst the air, which was even cooler out on the water. Why would she, Fliss said, through chattering teeth. Better to stay in the warm than to freeze her cockles off for someone she barely remembers outside the prison walls. There was bitterness to Fliss's tone that Betty rarely heard. She felt it, too, but less sharply since the discovery of their father's letters. The letters meant he still thought of them. He still cared. 
You've never forgiven Father for leaving us, have you? Pliss huffed out the long breath. I've tried. I'm still trying, but it's hard. He should be here with us, not in there, especially after losing Mother. I know he was trying to look after us on his own stupid way, but... She trailed off, looking over Betty's shoulder. Betty became aware that the ferryman was listening with interest. Bliss didn't need to say any more anyway. They both remembered how it had all happened. After their mother had died, Barney Wildershins had drunk and gambled, spiraling out of control. By the time any of them knew how much money he had frittered away, the poacher's pocket was deep in debt. Still, Father had insisted that he had a solution, selling smuggled goods. Only he'd boasted the wrong people, and he'd boasted to the wrong people, and been rewarded with a five-year prison sentence. It's Charlie I feel most angry for, Fliss said, ashen-faced. She had never been good at traveling over water. <laughs> she didn't really have a chance to miss Mother, but she could have known what it was to have a father, even a fool like ours. Privately, Betty disagreed. Charlie seemed happy enough, not missing whatever she never had. It was Betty and Fliss who remembered and felt the loss strongest, and Betty thought a little enviously that as firstborn daughter, Fliss had been their father's favorite, a daddy's girl. Fliss gave a little moan as the boat lurched. If you're going to throw up, do it over the side, the ferryman said without an ounce of pity. Keep your eyes on the prison, Betty told her. Granny always says it helps to look at something in the distance. Granny, it was the first time either of them had made this journey without her, or with the knowledge of the curse that ran through their veins. It was a grim thought that the fairy was plunging towards the edges of Crowstone, where their world ended. The prison looked worse by day. When Betty had seen it, the lit windows and flickering will-o'-the-wisps on the water the previous night, she could almost have imagined that it was a fairy tale castle in the distance. In daylight, there was no pretending. The stone building was squat and gray, hulking over the land as if consuming it. The rows of tiny windows were like mean, empty eyes. As the ferry drew closer, the bars on them came into view. Only one part didn't fit in, the high stone tower. It didn't look as though it belonged or was part of the prison at all. Betty gazed up at it, shielding her eyes from the brightening sky. Every time the curse is triggered, a stone falls from the tower wall. Without warning, the vision of a falling from a great height flashed through her mind again. Her breath and quick, her breathing quickened. What was that? A memory bobbed on the surface, a story of a girl who had fallen to her death from the tower. She tore her gaze as the fairy docked. Betty stepped off and held out her hand to steady Fliss. They wobbled past the ferryman onto dry land, past the line of people waiting to board. Whew, I feel better now, Fliss muttered, color returning to her cheeks. Looks like I'll hold on to my porridge after all. They headed up the path to the prison, crunching over pebbles and cockle shells. Up ahead, just outside the prison walls, was a seafood stall. Erd, Fliss moaned as the fishy smell wafted around them. Impatient, Betty urged her on, doing her best to block her sister's view of the jellied eels and Winkles. Then they were past the stall with huge prison doors ahead. Betty stiffened, aware that the sentry was watching them, Fliss in particular with interest. Betty rolled her eyes. Fliss could hardly go anywhere without being gawked at. Even when she was green from seasickness, there was no question she was pretty. Her silky hair and her dark eyes had always drawn admiring glances, but it was more than that. Her goodness and willingness to see the best in things was something people seemed to sense. Today, this was the last thing they needed, drawing unwanted attention when they were trying to find things out. Names, the sentry asked, smoothing his uniform like a bird preening his feathers. Wildershin, said Betty, in the same clipped tone Granny used when she wanted to hurry things or people visit people to hurry things or people up. Visiting? Our father, Fliss replied before Betty could interrupt. Betty could have kicked her. What if the sentry knew that Barry Wildershins was no longer in this prison? She held her breath, hoping that there was more prisoners than the warders can keep track of, or 
that admiring Fliss was enough of a distraction. Murr, said Fliss. She blew into her hands and gave the sentry a beseeching look, and like his boots had been buttered, he slid back and un ushered them through. They stepped into the vaulted stone walkway. The dark, shadowy shapes of the rats scurried along the head of them, squeaking and causing Fliss to que squeak even louder. Below was a rusted sign saying, Visitors, was another door. Through this lay a large room with wooden benches and a line of somber people waiting to sign the visitor's book. Oh no, Fliss muttered. Look over there. Betty searched the line, smiling tightly at a couple of poachers' pockets, regular, farther on, who were looking their way. It was inevitable that the place as small as Crowstone, they'd see someone they knew. What if they tell Granny they saw us, Fliss asked pulling her shawl up further. I doubt they would, said Betty. Everyone knows how cross she gets if they dare to mention father being in prison. Anyway, if they did, Granny would have more explaining to do about who she's been visiting all this time. As they waited, the girls' pockets and bags were searched for contraband and their scalps inspected for fleas with long tooth comb. The indignity of it, Fliss blustered rearranging her hair. Moments later, they reached the front of the line, and the visitor's book lay open before them. Fliss lifted the pen, dipping it into the inkwell on the counter. Under visitor name, she simply wrote, Wildershins, followed by the date, time, and visitor's number. 513, Betty read, trying to recall what father's number had been. Father was 449, Fliss said softly, not looking up in case you were wondering. Under prisoner's name, she scrawled an unreadable squiggle, then tore off the slip. They squeaked their bottoms into a small space on one of the hard benches and waited. Minutes later, the word Wildershins was barked. They stood up, glanced at each other nervously. It was time to find out who prisoner 513 was. That was the end of it. That was chapter 7. Ooh, it's so good. I'm excited to read chapter 8 to you. But until then, if you're about to start your day, I hope you have the best day ever or whatever you're choosing to do after this. If you're about to go to sleep, I hope you have the sweetest dreams and an awesome day tomorrow. And I can't wait to read to you later. So, bye for now. Thanks.